welcome to episode number 328 of Destination Linux. Destination Linux is a video podcast from the awesome Text Digital Network. If you're new to the show, Destination Linux is a podcast perfect for all experience levels. Whether you're brand new to open source or a guru of sudo, this is the podcast for you. My name is Jill. I'm Ryan. And I'm Michael. And on this week's fabulous episode, we discuss OpenSUSE Leap. Then we discuss small businesses getting some love from Canonical. Plus, we have our tips, tricks, and software picks. All this and more coming up right now on Destination Linux to keep those penguins marching. So this week in our community feedback, we have feedback from Colgrave. If you want to send in your own feedback, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash contact and send us an email or join our forum at tuxdigital.com slash forum. You can also find us on Discord. If you want to hang out, game with the community, or just chat about Linux, you can do all that on Discord. So go to tuxdigital.com slash Discord. So Colgrave says, I really enjoy the show. I found you guys by searching for Linux in my podcast app. I hope this show spreads to everyone and lets them know how amazing Linux and open source is. Keep up the good work. That is a proper way to introduce yourself to yeah. us. Yeah, exactly. Thank that is you. A fantastic. <laughs> and we also agree with your sentiment that we want yes. everyone to to find out how awesome yes. Linux and open source is <laughs> and how awesome this, this show is, in fact. Yes. I and mean, we're not biased. but Not biased at all. They go on to say... I just set up my matrix server about two months ago. I really love the concept and I'm able to set up bridges across all my chat apps. I'm wondering why we don't have a matrix server at Tux Digital as everyone is in the open source space. Is it too difficult to manage or Discord just easier for everyone? I would love to know. Thank you, Best Colgrave. So this is a really interesting thing that you mentioned here because there's a lot of history. We have with a this. story to tell you. Yes. We have a story. So unfortunately, Colgrave. You have to bear with us as we tell this story. So imagine me and Michael on the phone. This is Michael spending two and a half hours talking about himself and his hair and all the products he puts in it and all that stuff. <laughs> that and is about ridiculous. 10 minutes, you are way underselling how much time I put on my hair. Right. And then about 10 minutes about business stuff. And during that 10 minutes of the business stuff, I was like, Michael, there's this new thing, Matrix. It's really cool. It's privacy focused, security focused. I think we should move our community here. Michael usually hates it when I come up with these ideas because moving community is complicated and it requires a lot of work on his part, okay, although I do the server stuff typically. You're, you're leaving out some information, Ryan. So part of the story that he's leaving out is that Ryan said, hey, there's this new Matrix thing that we, and we should check it out. And I said, yeah, I had an account four years ago. So welcome to oh. the party. Yeah, but, something like that. <laughs> but, but I wanted our own community server. Yes. And so... We found out that Matrix offers the ability to host it yourself so we don't have to maintain it and we could pay them. And this is a cool open source project. Why not? So we pay mm -hmm. them. Now, everything was going OK. Matrix has some good things about it and it had some downsides. But overall, it was fine. We migrated from Telegram, I believe, at that point. Yes, we um, migrated from Telegram. Telegram. Yeah. 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 And it was and it was it was, it was good. Good enough. Yeah. And there were new features coming out and things. But then we started to find problems. And the first problem really came with moderation in there. And a particular instance that really hit us hard was a situation in which someone was selling drugs to people in our chat room. Now, a lot of our audience are adults, but a lot of adults let their kids actually listen to our podcast because we're family friendly. And I just want to clarify one thing. They weren't necessarily selling them. They were trying to, and they were spamming yes, them. Just they were trying that, to sell That's not what our room is for. Good clarification. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so typically at this point, as they're reaching out to people, private messages and posting in the main forum, we would simply ban them and remove them. No big deal. Right. Except right. my mod rights were gone suddenly. And so I messaged Michael mad at him, like, why did you remove my mod rights? You jerk. And he said, I got this, Ryan. Let me go remove the person. And he notices his mod rights are gone. Yep. And then we start reaching out to other people and their mod rights are gone. Now, drug person realizes they have no control. I can go full ham in this room. Mm -hmm. And they do. Mm -hmm. And we can't stop them. And they also and even like refuse to leave and just taunt the mods saying, yeah, you should ban me and all this other stuff. Like they, they knew they could do whatever they wanted. 
Okay, so this stuff happens. No service is perfect. We don't expect it to be perfect. We reach out to the service that we pay for for support. Michael does not hear for them for days. Meanwhile, people can go ham. We have no control over the rooms. We have thousands of people who are starting to write messages like, I guess Ryan and Michael don't care what goes on in their rooms. I guess Ryan and Michael don't want to moderate their own rooms and all of this stuff. And at this point, now it's hurting our company's reputation. It's hurting our reputation. And we paid for this service. Around the same time, an article came out from an individual that showed Michael that said, Matrix isn't as private and secure as people think. There are some major gaps in its privacy and security. I went and tested some of these and they were still there apparent. Some of the keys and things out there not being secure. I'm not a security expert, but the thing the person was pointing out, I was testing and what they were saying was a gap was actually happening. So at this point, we decided that we are responsible for thousands of people uh, for privacy and security who think they're more private and secure on Matrix. And maybe there is more privacy and security when you're comparing it to, I don't know, Facebook or something. But there are some real concerns here with this and the support we're given. So at that point, we decided this is not something we want to promote for our community. That's not to say Matrix isn't an awesome solution for a lot of people to do their private messaging and things like that. But when it came to a giant community that we were trying to house there, it failed to meet our needs and be able to protect the community that we had. And because of that, there is still a public instance of Tux Digital that's just hosted on Matrix's own public servers that yeah, anybody can Matrix. sign up Org. for. Yeah. But we're not going to promote it because I can't secure it and I can't moderate it properly. And it took way too long to get an issue like that resolved. And that, to me, creates uh, some major problems there. So... With that being said, Discord, one of the things I like about them is, number one, we're a public company and we're having public conversations. We're not a public company that we're sold like stock, but we're a public company and that our conversations are out in the open. It's about Linux, open source, all this kind of cool stuff. And so there's real no reason for all of the super encryption, privacy, security stuff in my conversations with community people. I just want to hang out with them, then be able to find me, message me and do that stuff easily. Discord doesn't sell your data. They kind of say that right up front in the privacy policy. And in fact, their privacy policy is far from the worst privacy policy I've seen. It's actually a really decent privacy policy for a company like that. Wait, so, wait, 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 mm -hmm. wait a minute, Ryan. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, um, you read a privacy policy? I read all of them. Okay, so we have found the one person that the privacy policies were created for. Ryan Reddit. is a unicorn when it comes to <laughs> these sorts he of is. things. I, I read them, uh, <laughs> and I, I do agree that that is a very unicorn thing to do, but uh, it's fascinating, by the way, if you do read the privacy policy, especially for your cell phone manufacturer. Um, but the privacy policy of Discord is actually pretty decent. So, and again, we're not trying to have encrypted messaging there. When Michael and I need to send something that's private, you know, I'll send it to him through Signal or Session or something yeah, along we're those gonna lines use that has made. kind of a long track record of history of protection and yeah. and encryption and things and all of those can be sometimes broken. we even go as far as to use carrier pigeons yeah, yeah. carrier pigeons or smoke <laughs> signals or smoke those signals. types of yeah. mm -hmm. so it's a great question this is not to be negative on matrix matrix is great if you're not running a giant community it is yeah. a really cool place to hang out ask questions and all of that cool stuff it was not great for thousands of people that you're trying to moderate and because you have thousands of people you attract lots of trolls and bad actors and all of that and that's it also not so great it's also not good because the moderation tools that they have are minimal at best. They created a moderation tool that then they stopped maintaining. So it just hadn't been edited and updated in years. So there's a third party tool that is more powerful and more up to date and more useful by a lot than the actual official matrix tool, which is just kind of a disappointing thing. Because now, they that, may have improved it since the last time you used it's it. It's been a few months, part. I yeah. will say yeah. that, but it was yeah. also two years of not touching it, so I doubt it. But who knows? Yeah. Who knows? I haven't yeah. looked in the mm -hmm. past few months. But there are things that I like about the matrix system. I mean, there, uh, there are some cool, like the bridges and being able to connect totally and having cool. one yep. client to connect to everything. That sounds fantastic. But there are a lot of issues with managing it, trying to have a community and trying to also we were trying to do business stuff on it as well. And it didn't really work that way either because it was kind of confusing in between 
the public instances and the rooms that were private and the the way they did the community versus the spaces and they switched over to that. It was kind of like a clunky experience overall. So there are cool things. And if you're a user on Matrix, you would have a, probably a good experience. But maintaining a community-based thing, it, it wasn't good for us. Yeah, there you go. So sorry for the long story, Colgrave, to say, to answer a very simple question of why don't you have Matrix? But I thought it was important because Matrix is one of those things in open source that a lot of communities and people move to And we were one of the first ones, honestly, to jump our whole community there. And then probably one of the first ones to leave. Uh, And And we just wanted to make it sure you knew why we didn't have one. We tried. We tried. We tried really hard. This episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Linode. Visit linode.com slash tux. That's linode.com slash T-U-X. And see why over a million developers trust Linode for their infrastructure. From their award-winning support, which is offered 24-7, 365 to every level of user, and involves human beings in that support, which is outlandish if you compare it to most other tech companies, they also have an ease of use and ease of setup. It's clear why developers and businesses have been trusting Linode for projects both big and small since 2003. Linode offers the industry's best price to performance value for all compute instances. Whether you're using shared, dedicated, high memory, or GPUs, Linode has you covered. And Linode makes cloud computing simple, affordable, and accessible, allowing you to focus on your customers and not your infrastructure. They do this by giving you the ability to create servers and build everything piece by piece. And they also have the fantastic app marketplace where you go in and quickly and easily set up anything from WordPress and Plesk to Valheim and Minecraft servers. So visit linode.com slash tux to get started. And when you do, you're going to get a $100 60-day free credit on your account. So go to Linode.com slash Tux. That's Linode.com slash T-U-X. We're going to talk about something today. This is a distro that we haven't talked about a lot, and it has a brand new release. So it's time we're going to give this distro some airtime, and that is OpenSUSE Leap 15.5. Now, OpenSUSE Leap is based on SUSE Linux Enterprise 15, Service Pack 5, and will receive maintenance and security updates until the end of 2024. It's different than OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, which we've covered a lot over the years uh, due to it being a great example of, in my opinion, Tumbleweed's like a great example of a stable rolling release, whereas Leap, on the other hand, is more of a release, has a regular release cadence, so more of like your Ubuntu uh, point release type thing. Uh, So a lot of people say that's going to create a more stabilized scenario for you to deploy apps and other things in servers, that type of stuff. Before we get into our review, I have to say something to our listeners here. I don't want to be the podcast that just whispers sweet nothings in people's ears because I feel like it does a disservice to our community and to the products that we're talking about. And I mention this because it is so much easier for me to write an article about something like OpenSUSE Leap or Ubuntu or whatever and say, it's fantastic. I love it. Oh my gosh. I hope everybody uses it. And then we'll get thumbs up on the videos, all the fans of the product come in and go, yay, you guys are awesome too. And then some new person goes and tries it and goes, what are they talking about? Um, So we don't want to do that, but we also want to be fair and appreciate the incredible work that goes in here. So we're going to try to balance this because there's some critiques here, some issues that we've all discussed this week in using OpenSUSE Leap that I think are major things that need to be addressed, but there's also some fantastic things. And we're going to try our best to balance those two things out here because we also don't want people to think we're beating up on anything because that's not our goal either. Because we have Jill here. She's nice. And while Michael and me naturally are not nice, Jill is. And we have to balance. She balances us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Now let's, let's, you know, address the giant chameleon in the room. And that is... (laughs) The issues we're talking about are typically related to the UI and UX of the experience for the desktop. Yeah. So there's a lot of cool stuff about OpenSUSE and we don't want to like, you know, ignore those and push them under the rug or anything like that. So let's first of all, just talk about like the things that we are big fans of with OpenSUSE are the underlying core foundation pieces because there's a lot of cool technology that SUSE and OpenSUSE have built over the years and they have continued to innovate in a lot of interesting ways. The open build service is super powerful and can build packages for literally every distro and even app images and all sorts of stuff. And then you have 
the open QA system, which is a quality insurance system that which was basically to create automated testing and you can build it for all sorts of stuff, not just a distro. You can do it for various different projects. And there are a lot of projects that do use open QA. And there's so many cool things, including like Tumbleweed, which is a surprisingly stable rolling distribution, which doesn't it's actually make any sense, you know? Like when mm -hmm. people do the argument of a rolling distro can't be stable, I'm like, Tumbleweed, yeah. boom, one Tumbleweed for me, zero for you. <laughs> like, I love Tumbleweed, like, <laughs> a lot. Like, I love Tumbleweed. So that's why I'm giving you, we're giving you all of these um, public service announcements ahead of time because there's some, you know, things here, and but we don't want it to come across as like we're beating up on them because they've done stuff not just for them but for all of Linux and distributions, like the OBS and stuff you're talking about, Michael, everyone can benefit from or has yeah. benefited. A lot of mm -hmm. distros have benefited from. They're very important. And so we're giving this feedback because I want more people to experience how awesome some of their stuff is. But I'm going to tell you right up front, the major issue that we keep kind of dancing around here is this UI UX. And there, let me just give you an example. You go through and you install Leap and the install process is not the best, right? It's the, the way it looks and then when you compare it to Fedora and Canonical, but the functionally it's all there. You know, you're kind of yeah. nexting through a lot of the stuff. Previously, one of my biggest complaints there was in, during network activation in the past, if it didn't auto detect something, you had to like go through two menus before you could finally pick your Wi-Fi that you wanted to connect to. Like it wasn't intuitive. And unfortunately I couldn't test that here because I was on ethernet. So it automatically bypassed it and knew it had internet. So, so there were some cool things there. I like that they did that. Like it already got an internet connection. So they even take me to that menu. It didn't need to, right? To say, hey, check your ethernet and things. But then there's this welcome screen that comes up. Again, nice touch. And it has an option there that says get software. Great. This is all working fantastic so far. I click the software and it takes me to a website. So I'm expecting like Discover to launch but I get a website to launch. Okay, that's different. So on this website, I scroll up and I search for Caden Live on the website. It takes me to a page with info on Caden Live with seven different versions of the package for various distros. Not for OpenSUSE Leap, but seven different distros and all of these different packages. And in there, it has words like expert download and things like, I don't know what this means or experimental. What yeah. does that mean? Which one packages. do I choose? Do I yeah. do the expert or the experimental? Uh, what do I click here? Uh, so finally, I go down to Leap 15.5, and the community package is the only option there. I click install, and I get this error that pops up that basically says, hey, download opensuso.org repository, blah, blah, blah. Repository can't be type can't be determined. Do you want to try again? I said no it keeps popping up the try again. Like I've got some spam bot virus on my machine, you know, like it just keeps popping and it won't. So I keep clicking no and it keeps coming back up and it becomes a video game that I eventually won because it finally pops up and says GPG key acceptance. Uh, you accept to install it? And I'm like, yeah, I guess that's what I've been trying to do the whole time. And then it doesn't install. Yeah. So that was my experience with this Git software. Now imagine... Not only just new users, but hey, I want to go try SUSE for the first time. I've heard some really cool things, open SUSE in there. And you have that experience. It's like it doesn't leave you with a lot of faith in the rest of it. Because if I just go to Discover, by the way, if that link just opened Discover, I went and typed Bitwarden, clicked install, and it was done. It was literally a one-click install. So why the website thing that doesn't make any sense to anybody but someone who maybe is a developer as the first intro to software in there. So uh, to address that's an that example sort of, of thing, the UI UX. I think it's interesting because the software website has been around in OpenSUSE for a very long time. They kind of did that before the store systems were built. So it's been there for a while, but it's it's been more and more improved over the years, but it has never got past the massive clunkiness that it has. So for example, you're talking about having to go and look at these different packages, all like this showing you different versions. So like you'll see Tumbleweed and Leap and Tumbleweed's usually the first option. And you're kind of like, why is it telling me to go here and then making it confusing to just get the thing that I want? 
And then when you do find the button that you want to click, you would click this pr- the button that says one click install. And then when you press it, there are 12 more clicks because it's going to open up uh, Yast if it works, if you know, gets through whatever the issue, Ryan, I didn't experience that, but it, mm-hmm. it'll give you, a, it sends you to the Yast and then you have to choose which version of the package you want and sort certain like that. But it also auto detects what you want in Yast. So Yast will figure out you are in Leap and will give you Leap options, but you still have to pick which version and that sort of thing. So it's kind of confusing because once you figure out on the website what you want, then when you go into yes, you also have to figure out even more different things. So more options. It's yeah. not one click. It's yeah. not one click. It's not one click at all. It should be called 12 click install. And the thing is, yes can do these things. If you go into yes directly, you can quickly, much more quickly find stuff that you want. Not it's not intuitive because yes is not the most uh, modern looking ex- uh, application, but it is uh, detecting what your system is and it also gives you suggestions much faster. So what I would want is for an app stream p- protocol or something else that is built that all it does is you click the thing you want, it opens Yast and then just Yast does everything else. Like that would be a much better experience when you're talking about these open SUSE comparison between the software website and Yast, what it offers. Mm-hmm. Now, I do agree that if you have Discover or GNOME software, it should just open those because that's what people are expecting anyway so having a separate store regardless just adds confusion unless that store has been implemented with like massive precision and great design effort and in this case that is not that is not the case yeah i've had issues with the website as well and it's one of the reasons why I've, i've just grown to use a zipper in terminal to install my apps right or a yast so it's well. It's that's a, one of the things problem. I know is going to happen is the people who utilize OpenSUSE and love it, like N- yeah. Nate, for instance, he loves yeah. it. Right? They're used to working around those type of things, mm-hmm. and to them, it's no big deal. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, but what we're talking about from a perspective is OpenSUSE and SUSE have done so much for Linux and open source. I want more people to appreciate how awesome yeah. their stuff is. But yeah. if you can't get past the basics in UI, UX design, you're limiting anybody who's not willing to or doesn't even know to go to a terminal and use Zipper or doesn't know Discover's there because they've got a welcome screen that says get software. So they assume all my software installs through this random website that has stuff to install but has 12 different operating systems there. And part of that's because they do stuff that supports not just OpenSUSE, but other distros so they have packages for other distros on there but you're kind of they're taking away from their own product in a way by making it so confusing and and frustrating there um i love yas control center as an Mm -hmm. example of things they do really really well and i've said this in all of my videos that i've done on OpenSUSE in the past i love that kvm's right there and available because i think it's one of the best virtual machine uh tools out there and kvm's built into the control center you want to create a virtual machine it's right there I like the software manager GUI in Yas 2. Uh, the other thing that turned me off was the wallpaper when I first booted mm. oh. in. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you didn't like Now the you lines seem like you're the nitpicking. <laughs> the wallpaper was it, it just looked like again, this is a brand new release and it so, looked like it was very retro, you know? It did and when seem you're looking retro. at a, a modern experience that you get in Ubuntu or Fedora and other distros and then you go to OpenSUSE Leap, it just feels like I went back in time. I actually would like to reiterate that, but change the words a little bit because you said it feels retro. And I would like to change that to say it feels old and outdated. Like that's that's more accurate because retro can be cool if you're doing it on purpose. True. But this just feels like it's clunky and it's not des- it's not done on purpose. It's just it's just some things you kind of see the design, you're the choices and you're like, why? So for example, in the KDE Plasma edition, there is the system settings tool and they use a ui that has been abandoned by every other distro because the new one is more modern and has been used like this for at least four or five releases of plasma i think many more than that but i don't remember exactly and the one they're using is a very old version from like plasma four days and that sort of thing and it just feels really out of date and you could apply this to many things of the choices made in the plasma experience and Plasma is the top 
option in the installer. So that's why we're talking about it, not just because I'm a big fan of Plasma. It's also because it's the top option. So you would assume that they're going to put the most effort in on the top option. But the things they do are kind of kind of going backwards in the sense that the default I'm not a huge fan of the vanilla plasma experience. I think they're they could easily make it better because they even have a theme called Breeze Twilight, which is much better than Breeze Light in my opinion for the default option, and I think that they should do that. But Plasma themselves don't use that as their default option, and OpenSUSE takes the default options of Plasma and kind of makes them a little worse, like changing the system settings or, you know, changing just certain coloring that just like the coloring of the window decorations is better in the default than it is in the OpenSUSE one. And it just makes me kind of wonder, like, why do they make that choice? So to go back, we're kind of talking about mostly design UI related things. But that's an important piece because first impressions, people talk about how they're like the most important thing. And the first impression for OpenSUSE is just going to make people want to try something else. Like yeah. as a person who is fully aware of how awesome OpenSUSE is and how SUSE and the developers behind the company and the and the and the distros are so skilled and build awesome tools and they were like the first to adopt ButterFS and people were constantly right. saying how mm -hmm. ButterFS is not great and they proved that it is awesome. Or snapshots and yeah. rollback system is next level. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. many Light cool CD features creation. that they have done. <laughs> yeah, they were the first yeah. people to make that. And there are so many cool things that OpenSUSE and, and SUSE have done. Even if you're aware of it, you still, like personally, I was still very disappointed in the experience because I am I knew I would have to change quite a bit to get to a point where it would be like just the standard modern style. Yeah. And well, when I saw that wallpaper, I was searching for like the AOL dial up icon next, you know, <laughs> like, well, that's what it made me do. I was like, where is that AOL? I've got mail somewhere in there because it's just it was. And then you look at the UI and it, yeah. it used like, um, I don't remember what it was, but was it Breeze? It used a very good theme that I've the, seen implemented yes. really well in other distros. But for some reason, it didn't look good. OpenSUSE's KDE Plasma used to be the go-to Plasma suggestion. Yeah. It was nice. It had uh, dark panels. It was very well polished. It had a green tint to it that was like the how OpenSUSE, yeah. you know, coloring. And they don't do that anymore. I don't know what happened here exactly, but I know that there was a, like some switch over to, you know, focusing a little more on GNOME and the enterprise space. But at the same time, Plasma is a default option, so people are still going to, or not necessarily a default option. There's no choice necessarily made for you, but it is the top option in the list, and therefore it probably is the most used. But it used to be the clear winner. And now I feel like they've completely backtracked and just put maybe... Or maybe just left it. When we first started talking about this, we decided, okay, we're going to try this out. And Ryan and I had, you know, similar experiences. We tried it off on mul multiple machines and we wanted to see like how we, what would be the first thing that comes up to us when we, and in, in design, the UI was the first thing brought up, but the, but that's not just, just design being the first thing brought up. It, Ryan brought up the design. Okay. <laughs> Ryan said that the design needs some help. They need to get a new, they need to hire a designer or maybe they need to let the designer have more control and that sort of thing. And th this is, if you look at Ryan's YouTube channel, there are some fantastic thumbnails on his videos that I made. True. Thank you, Mike. That oh. I made. Yes. <laughs> and there are also some other thumbnails that I didn't have time to make on those videos. And you'll, you'll be able to tell which one was made by me and which one was made by Ryan. Very clearly, the <laughs> distinction is you, you'll see them. And that makes me think, if Ryan is noticing the problems of design, <laughs> there is something to address here. I don't know what you're trying to say, sir. It's almost like you're trying to say that my UI UX experience is horrifyingly bad. And that's not what I'm you, saying. I'm saying that you pay attention to detail when other people are doing it because you can see the detail you just can't do the detail <laughs> it's true <laughs> it's true no what you're saying is a hundred percent fact i am horrible at ui ux design so i know that that's my weakness and i send michael my thumbnails usually an hour before i publish the show 
and then ask him. Well, I don't ask him anymore because that would be rude to keep asking him to make it. I just send it to him and he's so horrified by the result that he goes in and fixes the thumbnails for me. It's and basically, then, he's manipulating yeah. me by showing me something that I cannot stand. Manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we are we are technically in a business together, so it's 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 sort of to help the business. But at the same time, it's still manipulation. But just to give a quick uh, reference point for some context, just to explain why Ryan's design uh, uh-huh. eye. I. Yeah. His design so eye is um, where it Superior. is. Superior. Oh. Or where it is. We should go back to the idea that Ryan likes defaults. Typically, in every case, he just leaves the defaults as they are, regardless of what they are, and doesn't have a problem with them. Not to say that he's like, just doesn't care. It's just he doesn't have a problem with them. I and leave the, the desktop the yes. way God created it. To give, <laughs> the, give the, great, the greatest example of this is that Ryan showed me when I went to his house one time that he had default XFCE set Beautiful. up on his system. And to give you more context, if you've not used XFCE, and especially if you've not used the default XFCE, when the developers who took over XFCE many years ago saw the default of XFCE were like, what? Why is this our default? So even the developers of the desktop environment disagree with Ryan's opinion of the default. <laughs> But we say all this to come back and say, if I'm noticing it, yeah, there's then probably it's, then it's, it's glaring probably something wrong. So I, I think to your point though about either Open Susa needs to hire or, or try to get hopefully maybe the show some people who are UI UX designers will go in there and and help, or they need to get a, out of the way of their current designers and let them kind of create some you know infrastructure around this. Either way, or if you're good, at, if you're good, you could try to get Danielle Foray from elementary, something like that, to go in there and actually like because that that would be a thing, cool collaboration. Right? Yeah. Yeah. UI cool. UX is a special art. It's completely different than being able to create amazing, cool tools that OpenSUSE clearly has talent in. But the UI UX aspect is a different art entirely. And people like Danielle Foray, they know it hands down. They know how to go in there and make an amazing user experience, and that's type of person that's needed in open source, I feel like right now. And then what you're going to have is this amazingly stable architecture and foundation underneath and amazing UI UX to show it off. And then this conversation would be completely different that we'd yeah. be having. Mm-hmm. And I also wanted to say one thing about this. I am often a proponent for creating different experiences for beginners versus advanced users. OpenSUSE is a prime example of where a separation would be ideal. It would benefit OpenSUSE greatly because all of the cool stuff that you can do in OpenSUSE is typically in the advanced level. And if they just made that possible for people who wanted it to be that way, and then also made another version where it was much more simpler and could just do what is the necessary stuff, uh, that would be great. But during the process of installation, I I interacted with the installer like maybe four times, but there are like 12 to 15 pages that you go through and most of which you don't interact at all. So it just kind of makes me think, why are these pages there? Why are you f- focusing on all these different things? When you can just do it in the background and have some nice p- pictures and you know tour going across like other distros do, that's what I would like to see because I think there is a potential for OpenSUSE if, in fact, I'll go ahead and say this, I think OpenSUSE's underlying core functionality is so impressive that if the top layer first impression UI and UX experience was at the same level, then there'd be no question. They would basically dominate the the options. There would be the option of OpenSUSE and then everybody else would be competing for second place. That is what I feel like they could do Mm. if they they approach the UI and first impression at the same level that they approach the underlying technologies and the development of innovation of like the cool tools like OBS and open QA and all that sort of stuff. If they were to do that same amount of work, there would be no competition. Like that's Mm -hmm. how impressive their underlying core is, but it's suffering from the experience of the UI. Yep. Yeah. So Jill, what was your take on this whole thing? Well, um, I, the the positive thing about the installer that I noticed in this version is that it was actually a little faster than it usually is. And that's been one of my complaints about the installer is that it's much slower. 
You right. can install, you know, get Ubuntu Fedora up and running in less than five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that that's always been a bit of a complaint, but I do like the customization in Yast. But yeah, it doesn't need to be at the forefront. It could be in the background, like other distros use it. So in the foreground, you have the the slideshow and and all the all the pretty stuff telling you what your distro offers that others don't. And yeah. so that's definitely a thing. And I really do appreciate the leap welcome screen on first boot. It's really an inviting touch and I'm more and more distros are doing that. So that's, yep. yeah, that's, that's awesome. really I, great. Just to touch on that. I do, We talked yeah. about the welcome screen a little bit earlier, but I just wanted to bring up something. The welcome screen is awesome to see. When I first saw that, I was like, Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yes. And then I got <laughs> a little bit disappointed because the welcome screen is pretty lacking. Ryan talked about the Git. A software part of it, but there's other pieces that are also not really valuable. So there's the README section, which people who are beginners don't know what you what that even supposed to be. So when you go there, it's just a couple tips about some software access for a couple uh, repositories and getting Google Chrome and that sort of thing. And then the documentation takes you a bunch of guides inside of Firefox, which is not a big deal necessarily, but it's not that helpful either for a welcome screen. And then you go to the Git software section, like Ryan mentioned. And but there's also another section I think is the most important piece here, and that is the support section, which contains a grand total of zero links for support. There is a section for contributing, and there's a section for development of people who are going to participate in contributing. So they're basically the same thing. But one of them inside of contribute, there's also some sections to the forum, which could be kind of for support, but that's about it. So there, it's if you sort, if someone wants this to be a user friendly experience, they need to refocus the welcome screen entirely. And like even the bottom part where it's like a blog post of what's happening in OpenSUSE that was talking about tumbleweed, not the thing that they were actually using. There's <laughs> certain pieces where if they just implemented the welcome screen to show even just like an ask OpenSUSE, like how Fedora has ask Fedora and that sort of thing, that would be much more valuable to the user than the current state. So I'm glad that their welcome screen was there. I just wish it was it more useful. a little overhaul mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah, a yeah. little, little bit more love and focus in there. So I think overall, do we love OpenSUSE and Tumbleweed and Leap and everything OpenSUSE and SUSE do? Yes. Be very clear. We love it. At the same time, we're hoping if they listen to this episode, let the designers loose a little bit or bring some new design teams in to help with this, I think, like Michael said, this could be top tier where it's a mind-blowing experience versus like a, darn, do we want to even talk about this on the show because I don't want to beat up on anything type of thing, which is the scenario we ran into. And yeah. uh, I think it could be easily fixed. Honestly, this isn't a major hurdle. If this was underlying architecture foundation problems, exactly. then you've got a major hurdle. This exactly. is just putting some, you know, nice paint on it over top of it. I mean, this more feels that, like ultimately that's what you're doing. This is fantastic. I'm glad you pointed that out because it it's not like the underlying architecture will be much harder to change versus the top layer because the top layer is just configurations and making the choice of what icons to use and what coloring scheme to use and that sort of stuff. And those are fairly you know interchangeable. You, you just need a designer go in and say, hey, use this one and you make a change. That's basically all it needs. And with other di distributions or other things, they might have to do like more underlying changes and that could be a lot more difficult. So it reminds me of OpenSUSE is kind of like having a Ferrari where you have the chassis and the engine and all of these pieces of the Ferrari of this massively fantastic machine. And then you put cardboard on top for the body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for some reason. Uh, well, OpenSUSE has been around for 17 years, and it's got a very dynamic and loving community, a, a yes, very great community. and Very passionate community. Very passionate. Pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> with, with, and if you would like to send feedback to, to our show, you can send a message to Ryan <laughs> at TuxDigital.com. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You, you can go to tuxedo.com slash contact if you do want to send us feedback and tell us how amazing we are at making content. But if you would like to send us a message about how we handled this particular topic, well, then you can go to tuxedo.com slash error page does not work. Yeah. <laughs> We're kidding. We welcome We're all kidding, feedback. Of course. 
Yeah. Yeah. And make sure to check out Destination Linux episode number 232. Yes, this is a long time ago, where we interviewed Dr. Gerald Pfeiffer, CTO at SUSE and OpenSUSE chair. That was a great In fact, episode. I don't remember which episode it was, but we talked to Dr. Pfeiffer twice. Twice. So yeah. yeah. There was a, I don't remember what the other one episode was, but you know. Well, it's yeah. in our we have catalog. Long history sure. of love and yeah. Sousa. Don't judge us too hard yeah. for us just trying exactly. to get some critiques here. We are big fans know, of Sousa and Open I have Sousa. lots of geckos in my collection yeah. behind me. I have two <laughs> right here. Like I, I have, have geckos one hanging right here. on a shelf back there, too. Yeah. All right. So, listen, you want to know a software service that has an amazing UI UX, yes, plus it would. an amazing underlying architecture that you could base some of your thoughts of changes and things mm. on. And that would be Bitwarden. Oh, that's the, okay, yeah, that one. Because this episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash tux, that's slash T-U-X. Bitwarden's a password manager that allows you to have peace of mind knowing your online accounts are secure. Bitwarden provides you the tools to store all your passwords in a secured vault, auto-generate those passwords and usernames for you, even automatically fill them in on the login form so you don't have to. You can access your data across all of your devices, web browser, mobile apps, desktop applications, even the command line. Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end -end encryption before it ever leaves your device, so you know you're the only person with access to your data. And you can get started for free, but for $10 a year, I almost said month in my head because that's what you normally what are charged for things. Say, yeah. But this is literally just $10 a year. You're going to get a gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, YouTube Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator, Priority Customer Support, all of that for less than a dollar per month. If you do the math there, you can get Bitwarden. Have that peace of mind. That's what I use. Go to bitwarden.com slash T-U-X slash Tux to get started. Thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. Also, real quick, I did do the math. It's like less than 84 cents a month. So... It's, it's wow. a very good deal. <laughs> yes. I find that in my cup holders in my car. <laughs> exactly. And if you could yeah. protect all your passwords and stuff like that, like it's easily a great decision. So do that. Also, let's talk about the news. And in the news this week, we have some interesting information from Canonical and a new service they're offering, which is very cool. You know, it's fun to talk about when businesses do something cool for like small people, like the small guy, the, the small businesses. Spectrum. Don't say it, Michael. Don't. The, you I know, know the Ryan looked at me when you said small guy. I am average height for an adult <laughs> male in the United States. You jerk. Yes. People are okay. going to think I'm short and I was, not. He I was is not freakishly going, tall. I was yeah. not going to make a short joke. I was just going to, you know, reference Ryan. small guy. You looked at me. You looked Aww. at me. I didn't small look guy. at you. I just heavily implied you. <laughs> Very different. He is freakishly tall. That's why I need people to know he belongs I'm not, in the I'm circus. I'm not freakishly tall. I am above average height. That is true. Yes. But. Yes. Let's let's move. Let's not talk about right. height. It's not <laughs> important. You made it about me because you looked at me. I didn't like how you looked at me. Oh, <laughs> I'm uh, shorter than you, Ryan. So don't worry. <laughs> yes, it's really cool when businesses do something cool for the average height people out there. It's, yes, exactly, exactly. Canonical is doing just that for the average height people with their recent announcement of an extension to its commercial OpenStack offering. But this time, it's for small-scale cloud environments and small businesses with a project they're calling Sunbeam. Now, this project is 100% open source and is available free of charge. Early adopters can also opt in for comprehensive security coverage and full commercial support for it under Ubuntu Pro if they want to with support subscriptions. But, you know, you don't have to do that. That's just an option if you want to. This enables organizations to modernize their small-scale you know, like Ryan, small stature, legacy IT estates, and easily transition from proprietary <laughs> solutions <laughs> to OpenStack. And no need to hire expensive third parties to come in and modernize the things for you. So this, I, Michael, I'm going to get you back for this, just so you know. <laughs> I'm going to get you back for this. But this is actually really cool. So what Canonical is doing here is they're basically allowing businesses to be able to quickly set up and prepare for the future, right? Getting their stuff into OpenStack, Kubernetes, all of that stuff in the cloud. All these businesses are migrating to and utilizing and, of course, heavily reliant on Linux and open source without having to go hire firms and companies and things to go out there and do this for them because small businesses can't afford that. So they can set up 
and, and start getting their infrastructure updated and ready, whether they have cloud and legacy servers they're mixing together and all of these things, utilizing this service. And the service is like very, very simple to set up. So you install a couple of applications, you go through, run a few commands, and boom, you're ready to start building things out here on the stack. At least that's what that's how, they that's how it's presented. But, yeah. So they bit. specifically state that it's so simple, in fact, that even those with no previous open stack experience can get it running. And as people, Ryan and I, have no open stack experience prior to this topic, we can confirm that is not the case. Not the case. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's we, close though. Neither it's of us really could close. Get running per exactly. However, yeah, it was only like the last step where it messed up. But we have we we can last step. Yeah, we just wanted to make sure everybody knew that we did test to see if that statement is correct. And then just maybe there's a little tweaking that needs to be done to make yeah, sure that a little like work next in time, progress. <laughs> uh, canonical when you when you make the changes, let us know and we'll test again to see. Yes, because if you can get us idiots to get it to work, then you can no. truly make the statement. If you can get every one D ten T's to get it to work, then it'll yes. be totally fine. <laughs> yes. So the process works like this: you install multipass, then you cut, you run a command to get a fresh VM, say with Ubuntu twenty two point zero four, like an LTS, something like that. You install MicroStack. Then you do some simple kind of preparations and then you bootstrap OpenStack. And that's where it was failing is in during the test, which they have instructions for, for Linux, Windows, Mac, anybody who wants to do this test to show how simple it is at the bootstrap OpenStack, which is Sunbeam cluster bootstrap, except defaults command. That's the one where it would just hang. The whole system would hang. It would sit there and say it's doing something. And then eventually after 30, 40 minutes, it would just finally give you an error message and failed. I rebooted, tried it again, tried a couple different times, could not get it to get past that. So could be, again, something I'm doing wrong, potentially, but it said it was easy. It said anybody could do it, and I followed the steps exactly. So maybe a little bit of tweaks there, but regardless, I love what they're trying to do. I love they're looking out for small businesses and giving them options yeah, that's to awesome. allow them to utilize something. And I like how the simple the concept is to get set up is yeah. whatever's happening there, that last piece needs to be tweaked a little bit and then it will be perfect, I think. Well, the other thing that was cool in this article it talked about is that it's just, it's it's so much more than just another OpenStack or Kubernetes. Um, it uses Kubernetes principles and doing this, OpenStack can finally, you know, be modeled, deployed and managed as any other cloud native application. And that actually is really huge. Yeah. So the Sunbeam comes with a really simple interface, really well-designed interface as well. Really nice. Um, and then they also allow, uh, say that it's usable on machines with very limited hardware resources. So you don't have to have massive workstations very to be able to pull this off. And then it using, it's using K8's native architecture. Uh, and by running its services inside containers, OpenStack and gets fully decoupled from the underlying operating system and all that, it allows you to do those upgrades as a small business much easier. So as your business is growing, you can move with it, which is really important. So like I said, I love the idea. I love all the concepts here. Just a little bit of uh, tweaking on how the test, uh, at least, instructions go. And I think people would have something really awesome here. Yeah, they're sh shedding a new light with Sunbeam. Oh. Literally. Nice. <laughs> yes. Michael. Nice. We need to move on from Michael's uh, dad joke there. So, Jill, please. Never. Go in dad jokes are the best. Gaming and get us out of this dad joke. Aw. So, we love Valve. And Valve keeps showing Linux love. <laughs> and the Steam client has had a major, major update. If you haven't noticed <laughs> and you checked in the last few days, uh, you've, you've got a, a new... Uh, update from Steam, from their Steam client. And it has a complete visual overhaul, new features and new enhancements that will make Steam run faster on our Penguin desktop machines and Yay. on the Steam Deck. <laughs> yes, the hardware yes. acceleration they added for Linux is yeah, awesome. It's I'm incredible. so happy they did that. And uh, Valve actually says a good portion of the work they did in this update went into significant improvements under the hood, including changes to how they share code across Steam Desktop, Steam Deck, and Big Picture Mode. 
that this is awesome. This is and, the most important piece because this yeah. is something that is always a ideal situation where you have multiple different things and multiple platforms and using the same code base means that you're fixing we, everything unify. all at once and don't have to keep doing the work repetitively. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Un unifying the whole user experience. And uh, Valve also noted that because of the newly shared code base, many of the Steam desktop clients features rolling out now are simultaneously shared with the Steam Deck. Woohoo! That made me so happy. Yeah. Because <laughs> all their updates, you know, they, they've been moving towards this unification, but the updates have been done at different different times in the past. So now it's all coming together. So what are the new features, Jill? Oh, boy. So visual and usability improvements and dialogues, menus, fonts, and colors, including the screenshot manager, achievements, and more, a whole more modern look of All the right. user interface, and overhauled in-game overlay, um, wh wh which you can access via shift tab. And it has an updated design, new features, and more customiz customizability. One of the biggest new features, actually, is the Steam Notes app. With uh, You can use rich text formatting, image and pasting, and offline functionality. And no, multiple notes can be saved per game, and they are accessible via the in-game overlay, desktop client, and Steam Deck. And this it's is really, really cool. really good. Yeah. I actually was, when I first saw <laughs> this, I thought... <laughs> Do I really need a notes app in my gaming client? I, I, yeah. Is that necessary? And then I immediately thought about the fact that there's this one game that I play that has like procedural generated maps. And at the very bottom of the loading screen for each of those maps, it has a little number that you can put in and quickly go back to that map. So yeah. it's like cool. it's not like they don't have a, a, a exact map built system. They just have the procedural generally, but you can still use, if you like a particular map, you can always go back to it with that. And I realized in order to have those, those codes, I always took a photo of them with my phone. Oh, that makes and, sense. Because it yeah. was so much harder to like write it down while I'm playing the game. Now I can just have that there for me to make a note. It turns out that's a really good idea. <laughs> oh, it is. Especially uh, if, if, if uh, you all out there are like me and Michael and Ryan, we have hundreds of games. And sometimes there's a game that requires a, a specific, uh, you know, uh, uh, tax setting and configuration that you want to yeah. change. And this will help you <laughs> remember that. Yeah, so you know, that's you a good point because <laughs> sometimes I go back to these old games, you know, m months, maybe even a year later to play them and forget that there's some type of tax setting that makes it a better experience or something like that because I haven't played it in so long. So having those notes there is really helpful. But to me, the most exciting change, because it's hardware related, was the fact that for Mac and Linux versions Absolutely. of Steam, now you have enablement of hardware acceleration. Yes. Now that's unless you're on NVIDIA and mm. X11 because there's still some issues there. But AMD and Intel users can rejoice and utilize the hardware acceleration there, which I think is really cool that they've built that in. And then the other thing I have to mention is just the fact that they're still supporting the Steam Deck like it just launched. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. When you look at all these competitors that have come out from Asus and other things out there that are trying to kind of take some steam away from the Steam Deck. <laughs> <laughs> There's your dad joke, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. He has joined me on the side of the dad joke. Indeed. <laughs> you have to ask yourself this question. Are they going to support that device? that they generally did not plan for as long as Valve did to release the Steam Deck and, and spend as much passion into that project as long as Steam has. Because they have, on a regular basis, literally every single month come out with major awesome updates to the Steam Deck like it just rolled out, and they care about this device. I don't think you're going to be able to answer yes to that question with these other devices that are out there. And the other ones don't allow you to go into full desktop mode and use Arch, which is the superior distro of all distros. So, I based what on you that... Like, what distro you like, Ryan? <laughs> you should be uh, getting yourself a Steam Deck out there. Yeah. That's so, all I'm saying. Th it's also really cool that they're doing that with the Steam Deck. And I think it's fantastic because I recently saw Steam Deck commercials on TV shows. like It's like a TV service. It wasn't just YouTube or whatever. I was watching a TV, and I know people were thinking, 
commercials still exist? Yes, they do. You yeah. Click skip ads by when you're. Yeah, it's on kind of like skipping ads, but you can't skip it. Like, Weird. like for example, you're watching something on your. Uh, maybe you have an Amazon Fire TV, or you have a Gross. Roku, or you have uh, a TiVo, or something that gives you access to be able to watch these streaming services. And then some of those services have ads. I know it's ridiculous, but they some of them do. And then you're watching, and all of a sudden, a Steam Deck ad pops up, and you're like. Hey, something I actually like. I mean, I already own it, right. so it's not really effective for me, but I'm glad to see it there because people are going to get to be able to see this as an awesome product. And there are so many cool things that people are using the Steam Deck to make that it's more so than mm -hmm. just a gaming console. Like Ryan said, it also has the ability to use a desktop experience. So you can enjoy Plasma, in fact. Not just Arch Plasma gives you so many Arch. cool things, and including Steam Deck usage. <laughs> yeah, and I use the C Steam Deck to to create the show notes for today's I episode. <laughs> I use it constantly as a desktop as well. It's an interesting arch in the story, Jill. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, one of the other new features is that there's an updated controller configurator configurator, which is now part of the overlay when a gamepad uh -huh. is connected. And this is actually huge because before when you plugged in a new device, you had to exit the game and, and go into the configurator. Now it's right there in your game overlay, which is really sweet. That's awesome. Yeah. And boy, there are so many new updates uh, <laughs> in this version. Bug that fixes, we, all yeah, of that stuff. Yeah, we can't get yeah. to all of them. I also really like the new configurator. You know, configure with a K, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, yes. I haven't do. walked Katie. through that arch yet <laughs> to see the new configurator, but mm. I can't wait to see it. Maybe I'll look at it when I'm eating at the Golden Arches of McDonald's or something like that, and I'll go check out the configurator. <laughs> yeah, you you should definitely not K D E L A that decision. <laughs> you should. <laughs> You should do it now. <laughs> oh, boys. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I actually use the Steam Client beta on all my machines and have been testing out all these awesome new features for quite some time. Of course you have, Jill. And, you know, I love the new modern look of the Steam settings menu as well and the new features. And one of my favorites is they included a storage menu and settings that shows you how much space all your downloaded games take and how much space each individual game takes on your drive. Before you had to, you know, right click yeah. and go to the properties of each game in your library and click install files to find how much how much space each game takes. And you can still do it that way, but having it in the settings menu is so much more unified and quicker. Yeah, aren't Valve you glad is they changed unifying. that, Michael? Yeah, <laughs> aren't you glad? Yeah, aren't yeah, you glad? I am. <laughs> mm. <laughs> All right, so I Jill, <laughs> with a K, believe it. You know? oh, Jill, there's so many exciting things. Yes. I feel like if we keep going, uh, the show will be two hours long. Do you have one okay. more that you want to bring? I do. Go for it. Uh, okay. And something in, important for all gamers who want to join in into other people's uh, uh, games and, and uh, rooms. The game's selection and the overlay is now much easier to see when you want to join in a game with someone. It actually puts, puts the notification in the center of the screen instead of the bottom right. Oh, that is for nice. us yeah. that are visually impaired and have a hard time finding those notifications. This is brilliant, especially if you're running multi monitors and it would put it on the monitor on your right hand side in this corner on the bottom. Yeah. That is so great, it's... but also there is some, I, I think it's going to annoy some people who are doing a first person shooter where it covers the sites. So hopefully yeah. they make it an option to move wherever you want it to be. Well, that, yeah. that, that's true, but this is um, more so when you're going into the game overlay and you want to join a game oh, okay. from the overlay. Yeah, it's, it's in the center instead of in the, the bottom corner. Good, good. The kitty users are so confused with good UI design, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. I completely All right, disagree. So our software spotlight this week is Teleco. Now, this was really something we found. Speaking of KDE our... design and KDE applications, Ryan. Yeah. This is Don't true. You're, you're spotlighting me, a KDE application right now, Ryan. <laughs> well, you know, even a broken clock's right twice a week or whatever it is. <laughs> even a 
pot <laughs> tells the right time twice a day. Yeah. <laughs> Even a cracked pot tells the time right <laughs> twice a day. That's it. That's that, the that's that's the uh, yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the, the the pot calling the kettle right time. Yep. So one of our patrons was asking they they had a card collection. We're asking if there's a cool app for them to be able to organize that. And we were going through a bunch of options and found Telecos. So now we're bringing it to all of you. And out I just there. want to mention the fact that when we were talking about what are these options could be, Michael, me, said that there was an awesome KDE application. And then Ryan saw it and said, oh, yeah, we should talk about this on the show. That's how good it yeah. is when KDE makes applications, Ryan. Yeah, so Jill, thank you so much for that recommendation <laughs> of Teleco. <laughs> I really appreciate the fact you brought that to my attention and now we could use it in the show. It provides default templates for books, uh, bibliographies, videos, music, video games, coins, stamps, trading cards, comic books, and even wines. It allows you to enter your collection in a catalog database, saving many different properties like title, author, etc., depending on the type of options and items that you're trying to save there. It has import and export modes for CSV, PDF, RIS, all of these HTML formats, all of that type of stuff. That's kind of cool. If you've got a collection of something and you want to be able to keep track of it, make sure you're not buying the same thing three or four times. I've done that before. Uh, then you have this app, which will help you there. Yeah, yeah it's pretty cool because it does uh, any kind of collection or collections you want to. Basically, there are so many options that it supports that it's really easy to use because if you have something that you want, like comic books or coins or stamps or trading cards and that sort of stuff, it will have predefined fields in those kinds of collections. And you also, maybe you wanna have a database of things that are not in the list that they offer. They also make it possible to create custom collections that you decide, and you can decide what fields are in each collection for each item. So it's you basically can build it to whatever you want, and Teleco is just really awesome. And uh, as a have person who has used, used it, I have your, used it. Your Beanie Baby collection? I, 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 I wish I would let you finish that sentence first before I said yes. So I have used it, not for that, which I do not have. Unfortunately, I got rid of them over the past, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, shame. I miss my beanie babies. <laughs> well, you know, Bad I've voice. I've used... Uh, you, you, I don't know if anybody gets the reference, but it's like, where my beanie baby? <laughs> <laughs> I've used collection apps for years. And what I was uh -huh. impressed with about with Teleco is that how robust it is and how much detail there is and you don't have to pay for it. Yes. Yeah. So it's a very yeah, impressive a example yeah. of how open source can be awesome. Uh, absolutely. Well, Jill, thank you for that recommendation. Uh, <laughs> Michael, tell us about the tip and trick. The tip of the week this week relates to something that is something you should avoid. And that mm -hmm. is NVIDIA Nuvo drivers when you're using the 6.3 Linux kernel. You might be wondering, why are we telling people to avoid it? Well, what happened is that there's actually from reports that there is a use after free issue within the Nuvo drivers for the DRM kernel parts, and it can cause uh, corruption of kernel memory. Not only this is a security issue, but it also can lead to corruption of file system and other stability problems. So it is recommended that if you are using NVIDIA, that you should use the proprietary drivers to do your system instead of the Nuvo free drivers. Currently, no, if that's you're not using the recommendation. Currently, if you're using 6.3, or okay, you can yeah. also use 6.2 kernel instead. That's the better option. There go, go back to 6.2, then realize you still need the proprietary drivers and for gaming installed. and other stuff. And yeah, yeah. you're still going to probably install. Well, you can do anyway. some cool stuff on Nuvo. The Novo drivers the, now, so, but it's getting better every single time. That's true. The Nuvo drivers are very impressive, and the fact that they're Insanely doing impressive. they're doing these drivers with basically no help from NVIDIA, and they're re like reverse engineering it and making it as good as they are. Like that is impressive and just uh, astounding that they can make it that that good and have zero help from the company that makes the hardware. I would so, say zero, but very little, very little. Zero help that's actually help. They've been given documentation, but pretty much all the documentation I have seen released by NVIDIA is just confirming stuff that the Nuvo team already knew. So that's not very yeah. helpful, in my opinion. Well, listen, this reminds me of a movie I watched called Paycheck with, I think it's uh, Ben Affleck in it. Ooh. Affleck. I think it's that one. And it was a younger version of him. It's an older movie. I watched it this weekend, and the whole movie premise is he reverse engineers all of this stuff, but the co evil corporations, of course, put chips in it so he doesn't remember all of the stuff that he worked on while he was working for the company so he can't sell trade secrets. It's actually a really good movie, 
and you were talking about reverse engineering. So our tip and trick is also check out Paycheck Movie. <laughs> it's pretty good. Our tip and trick <laughs> is to check out Paycheck. Also, if you haven't seen Black Adam, check that out too. It's really good. <laughs> I saw that again this week. It's so good. I'm glad you brought that up. Anyways, that's it. We've run out of tape. We cannot record any more show. So a big thank you. I mean, it's digital you. recording. Shut up, Michael. <laughs> Each and every one of you for supporting by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, we love your faces. Come join us on our Discord at tuxdigital.com slash Discord. If you want to watch the show live, you can become a patron of Destination Linux and you get to join us live every Sunday. And watching live is just one of the awesome perks that you get when you become a patron. You can get access to unedited versions of the show. And for you can also join us in the patron-only post-show, which happens every week after the show, once we're done recording it. And you can do all of this by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership to sign up. So become a patron, get all these great perks, tuxdigital.com slash membership. And maybe you're thinking, hey, hey, Ryan, that's a cool hat you're wearing. Where can I get it? Thank you. And you might be thinking to Jill, that's a cool shirt you're wearing. Where can I get that? Oh, and then you, you also might be thinking, from me. I mean, that this would that's that's not a good suggestion, really. Oh. You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't tell people to steal your hat. But you oh. could also get this shirt that I'm wearing, all from the tuxdigital.com slash store. You can get oh. t-shirts, hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, coasters, and a bunch of other things, including what Jill's actually wearing is a yep. t-shirt dress, which is also available at tuxdigital.com slash store. <laughs> so check all of that out because you're you're not gonna you're not gonna want to not have swag from Tux Digital. Yeah. There's so much cool swag. You're gonna have to get basically one of everything. Maybe Absolutely. two of everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And make sure to check out all the amazing shows here on Tux Digital. We have the Pseudo Show, This Week in Linux, the DOS Geek Channel, Linux Out Loud, Hardware Addicts, Linux Saloon, and our newest show, Fit and Fueled. Everyone head to TuxDigital.com and subscribe to all these great shows. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching in the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. Everybody, have a great week. And remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. We'll Love see you, you next week. Also, just real quick, it was I, I just randomly laugh at the end of the outro because Jill said Linux out loud in like the quietest voice ever. And I oh. <laughs> Linux out loud? Oh, no, no, <laughs> I, just made, I, just I was like, I was just thinking about like how the, the irony of that being said but, so quietly. Michael, <laughs> you know what? You're like my arch nemesis. Uh, I can't comment. disagree with that. Yeah. Can't with a K, obviously. Can't with a K. <laughs> I can't with the K. <laughs> it's so bad, Michael. God. Why? Why? I don't know. <laughs>